to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ to a church that had a host of problems and sins to deal with. The Apostle Paul said, Let all things be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 40. Welcome to our series of lessons on the Church of Christ. In a world where there is mass confusion, chaos, and even anarchy, even at the religious level, what does God expect from His church as it relates to church order? Following His will, holding to His commandments, and doing things the way God wants us to do. Those are some of the questions that we hope to answer in today's lesson from the Scripture. But friend, as always, we want to begin by encouraging you to visit the Church of Christ in your area. These lessons are being brought to you by loving members of the Lord's Church who would love nothing more than for you to stop by and visit their congregation, the one in your area, and get to know them a little better. As always, at the Gospel of Christ, we encourage you to stop by and visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a host of Bible study materials that are available free of charge to you on the website, as well as if you'd like a copy of this series of lessons. We'd love to provide that to you free of charge, either on DVD or CD. You can sign up for that online through our free media requests for HORM, or if you've got a Bible study question, want to know more about studying the Word of God, you can contact us at the information given during this broadcast, or you can visit again our website, thegospelofchrist.com. What does God say about church order? We know God does want things done in an orderly fashion, for again, the Scripture says, let all things be done decently and in order. But to really understand the idea of church order, we need to realize more specifically what we're talking about in some of the basics. For example, when we talk about the church, let's realize that's the people. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, to Christians, Paul said, you are the body of Christ and members individually one of another. And so as we talk about church order, things running as God wants them to go, the worship, our life, doctrine going correctly, let's realize that begins on an individual level. If the church is made up of multiple members, then for everything to be orderly and decent, that first and foremost has to begin with me. Let's also realize that our God, by His very nature, is organized and orderly in everything He does. For example, think about creation. Genesis 1, you've got the Almighty God speaking into existence, the world, and in great detail, day one, day two, day three, and God looked and it was good. You can see the order, the organization, and the logic that everything God creates has. And friend, that tells us about His nature. God, by His very nature, wants things done decently, in order, logical, and organized. That's who God is. And thus, if I'm going to please God, I also must align my will to His will. To do things decently and in order, I, I want to strive to follow the pattern that the Almighty has set forth. And so we ask today, in what areas must we strive for this order and organization as God wants? As we mentioned, for any kind of order to exist, that has to begin first and foremost with me and with you. 
If the church is going to be what God wants it to be, then let's break it down to its most basic fundamental level, and that is each Christian must have their life in order for God to work through them. What does that really mean, though? When we say, I've got to have God's order and organization in my life, how does that apply? What are we talking about? Well, first, and very basically, it means I've got to want more than anything else to live for Jesus every day. Friend, this is where it all starts. This is the foundation. This is what everything is built upon. I've got to want more than anything else to please the Lord. Jesus said, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus wants me to put His kingdom first. Jesus wants me to think about my soul and the gravity, the seriousness of it. The Bible says in Mark 8, verse 36 and 37, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? From those two heart-wrenching questions of Jesus, we learn what's really important. Seeking first the kingdom, making sure individually my soul is where God wants it to be. When we talk about living for Jesus every day, we're talking about making sure that our priority is God's priority. In Isaiah 43, verse 7, we learn why we're here, why we exist. God said, Everyone who is called by My name, whom I have created for My glory, I have formed him. Yes, I've made him. I'm here to fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Isaiah 43, 7, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, whether we eat or whether we drink or whatever we do, we're to do all to the glory of God. How am I going to have church order in my life? By making sure first and foremost every day that I say to myself, you're here to honor and glorify God. That's why you're created. That's your divine purpose. That's your whole duty in this life. As we talk about really giving ourselves to Jesus on a daily, personal, individual level, let's use some examples of that to maybe help us to see the relative nature of what we're talking about. Paul serves as a perfect pattern. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Well, Paul, how did you imitate Christ? I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. What's it really mean to serve Christ first? Crucify self, die to the old man, and live for Jesus. Do you not know? that you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are His. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. It means that I want to follow the pattern of faithfulness that Jesus set forth. How does Jesus define faithfulness? Be faithful until death. Revelation 2, verse 10. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. I think of the words of Paul to the Christians in Rome, where he said, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Every day, my life and yours is to be a sacrifice for Jesus Christ. And so, on the most basic and fundamental level. If church order, organization, things are going to be done the way God wants them to, it has to begin with me and you really putting Christ first in our lives. Secondly, if my life is going to be ordered the way God wants it to as a member of His church, I've got to do my best 
to abstain from this world and its sinful practices. Question, the world and God. How do they view that? How, do, how does God view this world? And we're talking about the things that tie us up, the things that bog us down, the, the think of, things that keep us from putting first the kingdom. What does God have to say about that? Listen to this language. James says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world has made himself God's enemy have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, rather expose them. Now, I want to show you why from God's perspective this is something He demands of us. Think about the damaging results the world has had on some of God's people whom He loved. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. They had obeyed the gospel. They were Christians. They were members of the Lord's church. But the world got in their heart. They lied to God. They lied to the apostles. And God saw that greed had ruined them. Both of them died because they lied to God over greed. How do you think God felt about that? It broke His heart. Demas has forsaken me, Paul said, having loved this present world. Balaam sold out the people of God for money and lust and pleasure. Judas sold out the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Look at Solomon, for example, given wisdom from on high. And yet, all that lust and pleasure and passion worked on his heart. You know, when I think about this world and how I've got to make sure that I don't get caught up in it, there's so many examples that just shout out to us to be careful. Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21, a man had a great crop year. And he began to say to it was so good, he said to himself, this is so good, I'm going to have to tear down my barns and build bigger barns, and there I'll have room for all my stuff. And he said, you can take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry, he said to his soul. Do you know what God said to that man? You fool, this night will your soul be required of you. What was the problem? Wasn't any problem in planning. Wasn't any problem in having a great crop year. Wasn't any problem being rich. Here's the problem. That man thought about everything except his soul. The most important possession he had. Then think about this sad example. Mark chapter 10. Rich young ruler comes to Jesus. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What a wonderful question. What do I need to do to go to heaven? Jesus said, keep the commandments. Do not cheat, do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery. All these I've done from my childhood. Jesus then looked a little further and said, one thing you lack, sell what you have, give to the poor, come follow me. You know the rest of that story? The Bible says, that man went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Oh, don't you know that broke the heart of God? That's why God says, do not love the world or the things in the world. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. And so, as I think about church order, I've got to make sure that my life is really where it needs to be because I am and you are a member of the Lord's church. Then, as it relates to church order, for things to be done decently, organized, logical, and in order, as is the nature of God and the command of 1 Corinthians 14, 40, we've got to have order in Bible authority. Friend, things cannot be in order. Things cannot be done decently unless there is a pattern and a plan and a law to follow. And friend, you can be sure. God's given us that. Who has authority? God and His Son Jesus Christ have all authority. Why is that? The author of mankind has authority over His creation. Genesis 1.1 God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. God said, let us make man in our image. God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul. Genesis 2 verse 7 who made me? Whose creation am I? Who's my soul responsible to? God. 
Therefore, he has the right and the power to set the guidelines. Jesus has all authority. Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority has been given to me, Jesus said, in heaven and on earth. Well, what about in the church today then? Friend, Jesus is still the head of the church. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. Friend, listen carefully. The church has not been decapitated. We do not need a new head. We don't need a human ruler. Jesus is reigning on high from heaven itself. Hebrews 1, verse 4. And God's words already settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse number 89. Well, if God and Jesus are in authority, where do I find the order of their authority at? Right here in the Bible. The Bible is where we find God's authority for today. Two great questions are asked in Scripture. Jeremiah 37, 17. An evil king asked, Is there any word from the Lord? And Paul repeated this in Romans 4, verse 3, when he said, What saith the Scripture? Friend, the Scripture, the Word from the Lord, that's our final authority today. Great example for us to follow. John chapter 2 teaches us a powerful lesson. Let me set the background. Jesus is now at the wedding in Cana. He was invited, He and His mother evidently, and so He and His disciples attend that. And at the wedding, they run out of what the Bible says is wine. And so Jesus' mother, recognizing somehow that he can do something about it, says to the, asks Jesus somehow to refill those pots, and so somehow she knows he's going to. And listen to her words in John 2, verse 5. Mary turns to the servants, and here's what she says. Whatever he, Jesus, says to you, do it. Friend, can you find better advice than that? Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. I find what He says right here. God has in these last days spoken to us through His Son. Hebrews 1 verse 1. The Bible contains everything I need for life and godliness. It is all inspired, able to thoroughly equip me for every good work. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17. It's all truth. John 17, 17. It's everything I need to be free as truth. John 8, verse 32. And friend, listen very carefully to these two passages. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 6, the Apostle Paul said that some things had been transferred to himself and Apollos for their sake. Listen now. He said this, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what's written. Where's the order and organization and where do I find that at? Don't think beyond what's written. What's that mean? It's not in the Bible. I'm not even going to go there. If it is in the Bible, that's where my thoughts need to be. You know, when I think of this idea, I think of Revelation 22, 18 and 19. I'm not to add, I'm not to, add to or take away from the Word of God. Do not add to His Word, lest He rebuke you and you be found a liar. Proverbs chapter 30, verse number 6. Well, then as we think about order, let's also realize the system that God set up in the local congregation. Now, please understand, we recognize God has all authority. His Son Jesus has all authority. His Word and matters of, of doctrine and teaching, it has all authority. But friend, God has also on a congregational level in matters of function and expediency placed elders of the local congregation in authority. Now you find out about elders in 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, Acts chapter 20, and in Hebrews 13 verse 17. The scripture says, Obey those who rule over you and submit to them for they watch out for your souls. We know from 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5, that that is the duty, responsibility of leaders in the Lord's church. Now, if the Bible says, for example, that we're to give on the first day of the week, can an elder somewhere say, we're only going to do this monthly? No. 
they don't have they don't have the authority to change God's law, but they do have it in matters of function and expediency. Here's what we mean by that. The collection that's taken up on that first day of the week, what are we going to do with that? Well, we have guidelines. We're going to evangelize. We're going to teach. We're going to save the lost. But through what means are we going to do that? Elders who meet the qualifications, have that wisdom that the Bible speaks of, have the authority to decide. And my responsibility is to submit to their will as they follow the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so how can the church have order? It begins with me. And it begins with you in our individual life. And then we have to follow the authority of our God. But friend, for the church to have the organization and order and the logic behind what it does that God wants it to, we also have to have order in our doctrine. Doctrine demands that we follow the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That doctrine is designed to promote unity among God's people. Paul said that all the churches ought to teach and believe the same things. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17. We're to have unity. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And we have that as we follow the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Acts chapter 2 verse number 42. But you know, this order and doctrine, it also demands that we have to defend the faith found in the Bible. If things are being taught that are not correct, that are contrary to the Scripture, that are adding to or taking away or not staying within the boundary of God's law, Christians have to defend that. Jude wrote in Jude verse 3, he said, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I wanted to write and encourage you about that salvation we all have in common. He then said, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Yes, we must have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of error or darkness. Jesus would say to people in His day who were teaching error in Mark chapter 12, verse 24, You do therefore greatly err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Now, let me for a few moments mention some things that God's people need to have this unity and order in as it relates. And these are not all, just specifically some things. We need to have order, doctrine, unity when it comes to the oneness of the Lord's church. Friend, as we've stressed in this series, Jesus only ever intended to build one church. Listen to His voice again. I will build my church. Jesus said to Peter upon this rock, this statement that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. Now, did Jesus say, upon these rocks I'll build my churches? Did Jesus say, upon these rocks I'll let other people build their churches? Did Jesus say, anybody who wants to can build a church? Upon this rock, I will build my church. Singular, belonging to Jesus, and built upon the truths that we find in the Bible. No other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid? Another doctrine specifically as we think about having order in our doctrine, our teaching, is concerning baptism for the remission of sins. Friend, in the Lord's body, with one voice, one unison voice, we need to proclaim and teach what the Scriptures teach concerning baptism. The Scriptures are not at all vague. They are crystal clear on this subject. Listen to what Jesus said. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Question, what did Jesus say you have to do to be saved? Jesus did not say he that believes will be saved. Jesus did not say he that's baptized will be saved. Jesus said he that believes 
and is baptized will be saved. John 3 verse 5, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Did Jesus say you've got to be born of water to go to heaven? He absolutely did. Acts 2 verse 38, when people who realize the depth of their sin, the seriousness of it, cried out, what shall we do? The answer was not, say the sinner's prayer. The answer was not, just believe on Jesus. Here's the answer. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Baptism is for the remission or removal of sin. If sin separates me from God, I can't be saved without being baptized. 1 Peter 3.21 says it as clear as any passage. Baptism does now also save us. Friend, if God says baptism saves, with one voice, we need to have church order in saying that as well. We need order in our teaching concerning mechanical instruments of music being sinful. The Bible says, sing and make melody in your heart. The Bible doesn't say make melody on an organ or piano or guitar or bongos or whatever you want to think up. No, in your heart. The Bible says we're to teach and admonish one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Is anyone happy? Let him sing. James 5, verses 13 through 15. And so as we think about church order, friend, it is indeed possible, but here's what it's going to take. First, I've got to look to my life. If it begins, if the church is made up of individuals on an individual level, I've got to look to my life and ask, am I really committed and dedicated to following Jesus above all else? Then, we've got to have order when it comes to Bible authority. God and Jesus are at the top. His Word is how He revealed that order. And on the local congregation, elders have authority in matters of option and expediency. And then we must let God's doctrine have the order in our life and teach what God wants us to. Remember, the Bible says, let all things be done decently in order. And may God help us to have true church order. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, this not your wants. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.